out. My name is uh, Matthew Arlick. Thank you! My name is Nicola Torbett. Streets! My name is Nathan Schneider. Streets! Our streets! Our streets! My name's Carolyn Clausen. My name is Shonda Ja. My name is Reverend Michael Ellick. I, uh, 10 years ago, I was the uh, minister of Judson Memorial Church in Greenwich Village and a faith-based community organizer, um, largely with the New Sanctuary Movement, but with a few other justice movements in town. 10 years ago, I was the senior minister at the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. At the time that Occupy started, I was just starting my second year of seminary. Uh, at Union Theological Seminary in New York. I live in Oakland, California, which is where I participated in Occupy. Um, I am part of uh, United Church of Christ congregation. Ten years ago, I had just moved to New York City to start grad school at Union Theological Seminary. I was also at the end of my conversion process to uh, conversion to Judaism, and I was a member of Jewish Voice for Peace and had just gotten started in organizing with a chapter that was in New York City. Ten years ago, I was co-pastoring First Christian Church of Oakland with Tyomri Span Wilson. This is not my I first got involved in Occupy um, as a reporter for Waging Nonviolence. I was um, uh, this was the midst of the 2011 uprisings around the world. And from afar, we'd been covering all that had been going on in the Middle East and spreading across Europe. And uh, one of the things that we were really interested in was what happens before something like this, an uprising, hits the streets. <laughs> My first sense of Occupy was that it uh, reflected a deep emotional need of a whole generation of people. And it was very exciting. It was very, um, can't believe they pulled this off. Can't believe everyone's staying. Um, can't believe everyone continues to watch. Um, so I was really intrigued by it. And I had, like I said, I had a lot of friends who were very passionate advocates for Occupy and for what it was doing and had some highfalutin very well educated, but very, I think, in my mind, not experienced anarchist analysis of, of how it was gonna move. What pulled me in as it continued to swell day after day, week after week, um, was this did seem like a younger person phenomenon. It felt like a certain set of activists and a certain demographic. Um, not only did it seem that way on the ground, not exclusively, but that was sort of how it was getting hammered in the media. And you have to remember, I was in the business of trying to radicalize and activate communities of faith around issues, social justice issues in New York. And this felt like they were taking a huge leap forward in the analysis. And so um, I decided to get more involved and instead of just hanging out with my friends down there to kind of organize a faith space around this. To be honest, none of us quite knew what to make of it. It was exciting. It was, we'd never seen anything quite like it. And I also remember that it didn't quite fit any of the organizing frameworks that my friends had. And so that had, we spent a lot of late nights discussing, um, this doesn't quite fit in with what we learned about how to organize communities. Uh, how practical is this? Will it bring about change? Um, what is the meaning of this thing? I uh, didn't know anybody there. Um, they were not particularly interested in people of faith because uh, I had I brought that up um, at that time. That changed over the course of the movement here in Oakland. I think that what sort of initially attracted me to it was that it was this big tent. I mean, both sort of literally, there were lots of big tents there, um, but also, it, you know, it was very, you know, in a way that I had never experienced before in in, in movements was that it was. It really, there was everyone there, everyone was there, you know, from, you know, activists to labor organizers to, uh, to, to faith people to um, unhoused folks. Like, what, what seemed to unify everyone was um, 
was, was sort of rallying against uh, economic injustice. There were people on exercise bikes making smoothies, channeling their own energy to generate uh, electricity. There was the interfaith tent where there were people of, you know, Unitarian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, Protestant, Catholic, as opposed to some other actions where there's a there was a economic actions where there was a very strange and strained relationship between religious and non-religious activists where the, where there was usually a sense of oh we should have them it's strategically smart but we're really not in love with them this had much more of an organic oh yeah we see spirituality is connected to this uh work we're engaged in of anti-capitalism i gathered enough information to know that they were meeting down at Judson. So I believe that that's how I began working with them. Um, there were just a lot of people in a lot of communities that were doing things that I cared about. Um, the issues, particularly around economic inequality, were very live at that moment. I was really excited by the 99% language. The slogan of the 99%. The language of the 99%. And the idea that all of our grievances were connected and that we had common cause and that the we could be quite large, actually, and quite pointed at a system that was only benefiting a few. And really, you know, more accurately, we're really, we're really talking about the 99.9% because we're really talking about such an extreme minority of of people around whom, you know, most of the nation's wealth is concentrated. And it was the first time that people were talking about the 1% in common language. So we are here to support you. We are here to support you. From every synagogue and mosque and church. From every synagogue and mosque and church. To remind this country. To remind this country. That there can be no such thing as Um, also a lot of toxic racism inside Occupy, it's worth mentioning. And that was so prominent early on, so clear clearly a lack of racial analysis that um, that was another thing we were working to kind of um, heighten the conversation. Well, you know, one of the things that became apparent is um, Occupy's willingness to confront the police, um, to taunt the police, to ask that people place themselves um, in front of the police uh, and people of color were like, uh, excuse me, this is New York City. And we already don't have a good relationship with cops here. And you're placing our lives in danger. I think that that was one of the first uh, major moments where you could see Occupy people dealing with the idea that, hey, maybe this, this movement doesn't impact everybody in the same way. The problem is they didn't really respond well to that. Many of the particularly white people coming involved in this did not see a connection with police and with, with racial justice and racial injustice. This lesson about how economic injustice in this country is, is built on racial injustice and works through racial injustice and, and that the violence of the police became an education in that. Coming in to the bulk of Zakabi Park, this is a generational moment of people who have a certain view of themselves that do not have a um, unified philosophy, but have a general sense of disregard for the establishment, right? And a, and a, and a um, kind of broad sense of anarchism, you know, that, whatever that might mean to them in local context. But the church is the enemy on all those fronts, right? No matter where you're coming from, we know the church 
it's full of bastards, right? Like, and so, yeah, we had a lot of people who really wanted to educate us as to how uh, terrible we were and, and how um, responsible for so much oppression. And, and I think any of the, and, and, and they're right. They're totally right. Like you can't uh, be a person of faith, I think, with integrity without acknowledging that the church itself has been the main perpetuator of empire forever and with no exceptions. There's literally no, I mean, there, there are individual exceptions, but not as a religious uh, body. So um, I think that um, obviously if, if you're still here and a person of faith working with the church after acknowledging that, now you're at a more subtle level of, of understanding what the role of the spirit is and what the role of the church is uh, uh, as an organizer for uh, justice issues. I think that Occupy Faith we had more clarity, but what we didn't have, I think in the same way, was the attention of great numbers of people that Occupy had, because religion, for a lot of these people, still is the very last place they want to be, which is another reason that people of color were not interested in that, because even when we question um, the faith communities from which we come, we still have a deep respect for what faith communities accomplish. Uh, no matter what that community is. We didn't get broad respect until we showed up with the African-American community. That's what pivoted it, right? Like they were willing to kind of have us there, but when we showed up, we sh one of the uh, pieces we organized was the anniversary march of a black power march in the 70s that fell in that time period, like in October, some sometime in there, I can't remember the exact date. And we marched 10,000 people over the Brooklyn Bridge and ended up in Zuccotti Park. And this was not their event, not the occupier's event. This was the black church's event. And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, these people, some of them want to see this as a broader movement and, and you, know, you can uh, insult the white church, but it was much harder for them to insult the black church at that moment, which has its own problems and critiques. And um, so that started to change things. But, but the other thing it did was reveal a lot of the tensions around race lines. So independent of religious uh, tensions with people of faith, um, the faith community showing up writ large was coming up as a very diverse presence with very different cultural marks in their mind for what the struggle is and where it started and how it manifests. What's interesting to me is sometimes the religious tension actually was covering some racial tension. Uh, there was a prominent, very committed to liberation theology church in East Oakland, a prominent black church that had heard about Occupy and created some space for some of the young activists, many of whom were white, to come into the space. Some of those young activists were activated by being in a religious space and behaved in ways that the church leaders found super disrespectful right? Using curse words, saying derogatory things about the divine. Um, and I remember the, the pastor saying, if you can't behave in church, you don't get to use our space. All we're asking for is to be respected. Whereas the young people were like, right, but the church has collaborated with blah, 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 you know, all the language. And so there was a tension of people who had only had negative experiences of church not seeing this one invitation as changing the narrative in contrast with folks who said, you know what, all of white America has always been against us and we're creating this space for you because we see this alignment and you can't even respect us in our own space, one of the very few spaces we have. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree. They had the great paper mache golden cap, which was so such a good visual image. I was there when they brought the golden calf. So the golden calf was a part of the processional. It was like a miniature of the Wall Street bull, but it was it was designed to be the golden calf. And they marched around the encampment with this thing, and people loved it. I mean, it just. It was such a powerful symbol. James Salt from Catholics United <laughs> actually had this idea of a golden calf shaped like a Wall Street bull. 
and that was very exciting to me. Uh, this fits the way we were brainstorming, which is you know through archetype, which is have an image that tells a whole story to your heart and picks up on that cultural narrative. So this guy shows up, and um, we put out the call, and people showed up, and we marched through the streets of Lower Manhattan. Um, with this golden calf uh, over your head, which is a great experience uh, to have going past brunch people. Um, but then uh, that turned into um, kind of a regular gathering, faith gathering at Zuccotti Park. It's wrong for them. It's wrong for them. To bail out corporations. To bail out corporations. They do not bail out the poor. It was incredibly powerful to have that kind of gathering as part of the organizing and really kept me aware at all times of what we were doing and just how bad the consequences of our systems were and how much work it would take, not just at a structural level, but just how much like people work it was going to take and how hard building any sort of community that serves us all is going to be when we've been so badly harmed by the existing structures that we have. I think a lot of us were noticing that under the guise of ideological uh, conflict between such communities, not just the African-American church, which is not one community, but just to speak broadly for a second, um, a lot of behavior that is just at best microaggression. Um, but just flat out racist with zero education or knowledge outside of their issue of how economics touches race in America in any way. I can think of a billion little conversations that reflect what I think became a general mode that this was um, that you can't make a movement like this led by these people. Right. And that if unless race is at the center of an argument around economics and colonialism in America. Um, that wasn't going to do. That wasn't going to happen, right? So Occupy was trying to be intersectional, but it, um, but it, it, I think on the ground, didn't quite have uh, the experience, right? It, it still was being held by a few white guys, was the perception. Um, I think a lot of people, as they deepened their understanding of the nature of the problem, started to recognize that maybe our frame here is all wrong. Going to Wall Street, using language of occupation, right? Evo evoking colonization. Maybe that, maybe everything about this is kind of backwards. And in some ways, you know, when, when Black Lives Matter swelled up a couple of years ago, a lot of these people had, a, had now, you know, a, 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 an analysis and a, a place to work from um, to 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 be allies that you know that that Occupy couldn't have been.
My experience of protest in general is that there is something very spiritual around uniting people in a cause to push to make the world more just in some way. And Occupy was the largest and longest lasting expression of that I've ever found. So there were a lot of like transcendent moments, especially around the marching. And then the day-to-day realities of trying to organize together were very rough and tough and trying. There's one class I teach on social justice and theology. The class that I was teaching this past semester when they said, yeah, Occupy was just a flash in the pan. The Seattle protests were just a flash in the pan. The Zapatista movement didn't have any long lasting impact. Those resistance efforts to um, anti-poor people legislation of the 1990s didn't have any carryover. I asked the students, how many of you have been involved in the Wall Street, uh, sorry, the Walmart workers campaign? And most of them had been in some fashion. How many of you have been engaged in the fast food workers campaign of the past five years? And some of them had been. How many of you have been involved in the poor people's campaign? And most of them, almost all of them were. And I said, do you ever wonder what landscape led to those to those current day campaigns being possible. And it hadn't crossed their mind. So they didn't see any connections. They hadn't been able to connect the dots. But for me, um, while I have my sadnesses and uh, heartbreaks over the ways that white privilege and, um, and a lot of other things played themselves out in those spaces, I do not think we'd be having the conversations we're having now about increasing the minimum wage, around access to health care, around people's active responses to how horrific uh, the COVID response has been. I don't think any of those things would be possible without the ground that was laid uh, in, in those days. The gathered community is always a spiritual experience for me. So when I saw all of us in our collars or in our hijabs or um, kneeling and praying that people would begin to see and to understand and that they would feel a sense of urgency. That was spiritual for me. And I remember one meeting we had at Judson with all of the different faith leaders and we were sitting in the circle and we were still working out what our relationship was going to be with Occupy itself. But I think it was Donna who decided that we all ought to read out loud the complete texts of Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Now I've read it any number of times. But there was something about hearing it out loud and hearing it in a community a multiracial, multi faith community of people committed to making a change and hearing in people's voices that they were being convicted by some of Dr. King's words. Because everybody loves Dr. King on the 15th of January, but nobody ever quotes from his really incisive things about what people have to do, why moderates are a clear and present danger, things about the economic inequalities and injustices that black people face. That's the part they never want to quote, ever. But to hear this group of faith leaders reading it and taking it in in a new way in light of this upheaval in understanding the economy and the injustice of it all. There's no conversation that we're having right now about economic inequality that could have taken place without Occupy. And I think people forget that. It's not that they, um, it's not that the inequalities weren't real, but they were invisible in some crucial ways. And Zuccotti and the other things around it and the language of the 99% and the 1%. Bernie didn't have that language. He got that from Occupy. All those things are the fruits of what at the time looked like a fruitless exercise. 
Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's all a spiritual experience. If you're up, if you're downtown at 3 a.m. in a bar planning to use stilt to get over a gate to break into another church, then yeah, that's a spiritual experience, and it's one you're never going to forget. And but but uh, uh, less of an ecstatic, roomy. Um, a religious experience and one that comes out of friendship and discovery. I mean, some of the best friends I have in my life, I found in Occupy. And finding uh, people both in and out of the faith community who felt like they had a deeper analysis on what needs to happen to our civilization, um, that was magic. And it was like a lot of people got to find each other. And so, um, in a sense that you know, you need catastrophe to sort of re-scramble the neurons and have them reconnect. Uh, I found a whole universe of people who I felt like were having a much more sophisticated analysis on where we are as a people and as a culture. And what is it going to take to knock that? And uh, to me, that was magic and it was liberating uh, to not feel like I was alone on a few things. And, um, and I think that to this day, I still work with people all around the country who I met in that time. It felt honestly like a glimpse of the second chapter of Acts when people held all things on, in common, you know, which is to say it felt like a glimpse of the kingdom of God or the beloved community in action. Um, so I think it, it raised the bar for me and my what I expect from a community of people who say they they have a spiritual life. You know, I I come up in this kind of Catholic radical tradition of in which the street is a holy place, in which in which uh, uh, you know being uh, you know embracing poverty for the sake of justice is you know a very old old game, and um, so the things that they were doing. The things that they were talking about, the idea of, of living your your values in the most radical way that you can in a, a a space of shared community, you know, is to me incredibly core to to what the you know what the Christian movement is is all about. And so I actually felt in some ways more at home than I had in many religious spaces. And this is a mystery I still am sorting out. But you know, I had I, I'm a convert. I became uh, Catholic when I was a teenager, and for years and years after, I really didn't feel comfortable identifying myself as a Christian. I was so uncertain about that identification, about that identity. You know, being in kind of being present to and documenting and and even participating in in this protest movement. That actually that went away. I remember having this feeling of being in the subway, you know, coming, you know, I was, I was going somewhere off the square and coming back one day and just feeling like I am not in the real world until I get back there. Right. And I, I can't but help but imagine that, the, you know, the first Christians felt that way. In terms of thinking about what I what I learned from Occupy is that um, is that movements also have seasons. You know, there's always that initial surge of, of energy and productivity and hope that happens right at the beginning. And then there's usually an ebb. Um, and I find that sometimes people who are, are newer to justice work get very frustrated by that. I think one thing that I learned from Occupy in some ways is that the measure of a movement's success is not in how many people continue to protest. That, that the measure of a movement's success is how many people become radicalized and mobilized um, in a variety of ways and and how many people continue to do that slower and often you know less exciting but i think maybe more crucial work um, of organizing for justice and i think occupies a great example of that Ah! <laughs>